Welcome to Studio B here at Forum Studios. Today we are doing a camera test and virtual production to see which cinema cameras are great options and which ones you shouldn't even think about bringing on set. That's insane. Can you guys get in there tight on that? Wait, what? That's not good for sure. To help us test and evaluate each of these cameras, we have two amazing DPs with us. Mick Hawkins, going on eight years as a DP, has personally worked with Remedy on a handful of projects in our virtual production studio, works a ton in commercial and promo work. Mick, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. Next up, Mr. Tom Wells, the multi Emmy Award winning DP with over 20 years of experience with commercials and image campaigns and over 10 years shooting on LED walls. But today is his first day shooting on an LED wall with virtual production and in-camera VFX. Tom, so happy to have you here, man. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to getting some hands-on experience. So today we have eight cameras that we're gonna test on the LED volume. We have some really high-end cameras. We've got multiple Aries, multiple Reds, some cameras I haven't worked with like the Canon and the Black Magics. So um, I am really curious to see what's going to happen with those. The point of our test today is to take all of these cameras at their base settings and see how they respond right away. If you've never shot on an LED volume and this is this could be your first time shooting in virtual production with in-camera VFX, this test is gonna be especially great for you because you want to know which camera you can bring on set and not have to problem solve. We're gonna take all of our cameras and put them into two tests, a light, bright, daylight scene, and then the second scene being a dark scene. We're gonna to try to control as many variables as we can. So we're gonna test at a frame rate of 2398. We're gonna shoot the cameras at the same ISOs across the board using similar lenses. All of these factors are really important to measure our main metric, which is, are these cameras going to have any screen tearing or flickering issues right out of the case? I think it'll be interesting to see how global shutter matters, how gin lock matters, and then really break it down to see the cameras that don't have either of those and the cameras that have all of those. Gin lock is a core piece of virtual production. It's basically the heartbeat of our entire system. It makes sure that our frame is being rendered and then refreshed on the wall at the same time that our camera's in capturing that frame. One of the cameras that we're testing today doesn't have gin lock, which I think is great to show people, hey, this is why you can't use lower end cameras. Even the cameras we're using to shoot this interview right now don't have gin lock. So the screen flickering that you see behind me and the screen tearing that we're probably gonna see in some of these tests today are the main reasons why you can't bring in certain cameras into virtual production. Reds, Aries, Venice, all of those are being used regularly on shows and movies that are being shot on an LED volume. But you don't always have two weeks of prep before you work on a project. So to be able to take these cameras, have them all in the same room today, and plug them in and see how they respond right out of the box, I think is, is a great thing for us to get to try. We're ready to get this test going, but first things first, we need to set and light our scene. All right, we got the lighting all done. We got our first two cameras, the red Komodo and the black magic pocket 4K. Yeah, I mean, right off the top, I see some like banding, um, and you're talking about these these things right yeah, here? These lines that are coming through <clears throat> and some of the color, just colored discoloration. Let's take a closer look at that. So this is the screen tearing that we're talking about with LED walls, right? Yeah. Um, Sean, would you mind like tilting that camera a bit so we can we can really see it? So we got these these lines that are showing up, which is exactly what we don't want and what makes That's virtual deep. production not gonna actually sell. Yeah, that tearing is very obvious in this camera for sure. Can we show the Komodo? Let's see that difference just between flicking back and back and forth because you're seeing it right there on the, on the blinds right yeah you can see just these lines that are running sure. horizontally john would you mind giving us a little bit of tilt movement on the komodo as well yeah yeah so where it was really obvious right away on those shutters i'm not i'm not seeing it right away at all yeah i think we've seen what these two cameras can and can't do the screen tearing alone is essentially gonna knock it out and say that this shouldn't be a camera that you think about bringing yeah that's that's not good for sure I think it's great that our first test showed two cameras that had completely different results. You had the pocket cam that had obvious screen tearing right away. I mean, it was the first thing that you could see when we flipped over the input. And the Komodo had great results. So now we know what a successful camera looks like on the wall. So the next cameras would be the C500 Mark II and the Sony Venice. So expectations, are these gonna pass or fail our first test? I would expect the Venice to pass. Um, I'd be surprised if it didn't. Is it gonna pass? Is it gonna fail? Sorry, I whispered, didn't I? 
Is it gonna pass? So looking at these two cameras right off the bat, um, our image interior is exposed fairly moderately, so everything's within range, but yeah. you can definitely see the Venice is, is holding that a bit better. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at these with our main metric and see if we have any screen tearing as we kind of move the camera around. So let's start with the uh, C5, because that one we have had some issues with in the past, which I'm not seeing as much. I can't tell, are we seeing a little bit of screen tearing right there? Let's check out the Venice, see if it's still there. Oh, it's still in the Venice, so that much must be part of the world. Yeah, I think that's just the texture and the shutter that we're seeing. Well, I'm surprised. We've had a lot of screen tearing issues. Mm -hmm. So for this not to be screen tearing is surprising. It does happen more often in darks and shadows and dark scenes, and this is a, a brighter scene, but the fact that with the pocket 4K we're having it in that shutter and not having it now in the C5 still is surprising to me, mm -hmm. right? Yes. All right, well, let's see how the Venice is doing. No yeah. surprise there. Right. Nope. I think we, ex we expected that it would be one of the best looking ones. True. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any issues that are standing out immediately. Same. All right, looks like the Sony Venice and C500 passed this test. On to the next ones. Fair competition. So, is it a fair competition? <laughs> so basically in the end, we're just trying to have the same composition from camera to camera so that we can compare them relative to each other. And to do that, we just have to make some minor tweaks by moving the cameras forward and back. We're panning, and we're panning, and we're panning, and we're panning. <laughs> Professional panning. Okay, so we've got the Mini LF and the Ursa side by side, which doesn't seem fair, but looking at them side by side, what do you think? As far as the screen tearing goes, I think that both of them seem to hold up without any issue. So if, if we tilt the Mini, let's see what... Wait. The Ursa Mini or Alexa Mini? That's a good, the, yeah, great yeah. question. Alexa, you're right. If we tilt the Mini LF, let's see the uh, screen tearing. Mm, like butter. No. Nope. Yeah, I don't see anything there. No, it, it looks great. I mean, we've got it gen lock. We got both of these cameras from here on out are able to gen lock, and we're seeing the advantage of that. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's check out the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro. Uh, maybe a little something going on here. I can't tell what that is. I see a little bit of. Uh, in the trees? You're yeah, right. Right here on the edge of the shutters, there's a little yep. bit of, a, of an issue. Give us a fast, faster tilt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it pretty well up top there as well. Yeah, as we blow up the image, it becomes a little more obvious that there's some, some uh, tearing going on in the background in some of the darker areas. It's certainly not as obvious as the Blackmagic Pocket. Still certainly not an issue that you actually want to have on set. Yeah, I don't think I would feel comfortable uh, using that for sure. <laughs> yep, I agree. So the Ursa might be a good option if you're actually just trying to shoot something that's still on sticks, but as far as any sort of camera movement, sliders, easy rigs, handheld, whatever, um, I don't think Ursa Mini Pro is going to pass this test. Sure. No, I don't think so either. Lexa Mini LF, going to the next round. Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro, you done, son. This is the junk. I do some directing, I do some editing. I don't do so much cam mopping. I'm just gonna hold this as tight as I can until a DP comes and takes it from me. DP! All right, here we are, the golden child, Lex 35. Guys, tell me what you're seeing here. As far as screen tearing or any degradation in the background, they're virtually identical from first looks. So from that perspective, they both seem to be holding up without any issue at all. Sean, can we get some tilt action? Mm-hmm. Let's go Raptor first. Raptor. Yeah, I don't see anything either. Mm-hmm. Really trying to look hard in that shutter. All right, Sean, can you hop over there and give us some tilt action on the Lex 35? Looks clean to me? Sure, you know, it was pretty clear with the pocket cam, and that kind of set us up to go right away. Like, okay, this is what obvious screen tearing looks like. Yeah, obvious screen tearing. I didn't want to say what looks bad, but I mean, it, it doesn't look great, yeah. you know, when you do have screen tearing, and it, it's pretty clear that, you know, no issues here. Yeah, for sure. You want to see these things with a little bit of a darker exposure? Yeah, I think it's time that we uh, adjust our lighting and switch to our night scene and then do our final test. I'm loading up our night version of the scene, which typically darker scenes show off the issues with the camera a bit quicker than brighter scenes. Let's see what works. Let's see what doesn't. Here we go. 
back to the Canon C500 and the uh, Venice One. Had these up earlier, comparing them to each other. Both of them held up great um, on the bright scene. So we'll see what happens when uh, we're in a little bit darker environment now. Let's look at the Canon first, because I think that one is notorious for um, giving issues. I'm looking up here across the top, really close to the top of the frame. Oh, yeah. and sure. I see some sort of anomaly definitely happening as you tilt up and down. It's not really obvious at all when the camera's still. Yeah. But as you're uh, tilting up and down, I can definitely see some scan lines breaking down. It's not super obvious, but there's definitely something there. It's not 100%. It's still, still not what you want as far as the confidence level when your camera going into a virtual production shoot. Let's do a, a quick flick over to the Venice here. It's definitely got a different, a very different, you know, LUT that we're looking at here in terms of just what it looks like from a dynamic range, but you gotta wonder what, what is in the LUT there as well. I don't see any screen tearing with it just like being still though. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I'm not seeing any tearing going on at all. Sean, um, maybe let's, give us a little tilt. Yeah, let's tilt it a little bit mm -hmm. and move, get some camera motion and see if anything emerges. Yeah, I don't see anything happening that's throwing up a red flag. For this test, this seems to look great and hold up just fine, though. Cool. All right. Well, let's go to our next cameras. Let's do it. So we've got the Red Komodo uh, sitting next to the Mini LF, which both of these looked great on the light scenes. Yep. Mini LF just obviously bringing a lot to the table, but the Komodo having the global shutter is what we've been interested in for a lot of this stuff. True. Tom, what do you think about it right away? Well, I don't see any breakdown. Uh, in the backgrounds, no tearing. It's it's obvious right this second. We haven't tried moving the cameras at all, but the LF looks great. Um, the color looks great. Um, there's a lot of depth there for sure, but uh, I don't really see any issues with either one, to be honest with you. Yeah. Which we've shot a number of projects using this exact camera on this exact wall, so I'm, I'm not surprised they're not having any issues. I'd actually be more surprised if we did find an issue. Sure. <laughs> That's great. Can we That's see the, uh, the LF with, with some tilts? It's interesting. I'm definitely seeing some, some, something going on here. It's, yep, yeah, there it is. There. Uh -huh. Yeah, a little bit of a banding issue. It's, yeah, I, it's it, right on the top third. It felt like it got more evident as we talked about it, too. Like, it was barely there, and I, it felt like it got really strong. Yeah, I mean, it's, yep. I can definitely see it right when it starts to move. It's, it's along the top third. Yep. Yeah, let me see it even. I don't see it banding across her face, so I'm assuming that's definitely the background and not just yeah. an anomaly in that's the monitor. That's a great point. Well, it's, it's, it's very obvious something's going on, so I would be curious to see um, if there were you know, any adjustments down the line that you could make to help minimize that. I have to say it's a little discouraging to see, to see that sure. pop up on the LF. <laughs> There's almost always a workaround for some sort of problem that you have on set, but right. the goal is to minimize that as much as you can so that you don't have to find workarounds for anything. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see the 35, right? Same Alexa technology. I mean, different different sensor and color science, but yeah. very curious to see if the Alexa 35 has a similar issue. See what our last two hold, and, and we'll be able to look back on this Mini LF compared to the 35 and see if uh, there's a difference. Okay. Cool. Last test of the day. What do we got, Tom? Well, Alexa 35 and the Raptor XL side by side. Um, I mean, right off the bat, they're still both holding up really well, as far as we can tell. Um, maybe we can get a little bit of motion on the on the 35 and see what yeah. happens. Yeah. Seeing a little bit of something right here along the top immediately. So after seeing a little bit of screen tearing on the Mini LF, now we're also seeing it on the Alexa 35. It's a bit surprising to me. I mean, those two cameras are the top of the industry. They're used on so many different projects, but we're seeing that right out of the box, walking in the door from a rental, that they're not quite ready to go. An inch down from the top of the frame. I feel like that's almost like the exact same location as the, the Mini LF. Mm -hmm. Would you guys say that it, it's about the same intensity or do you think it's better or worse? I think it's about the same personally. It's it, if it's different, it's minuscule, mm. but it's I mean it was noticeable really quickly on the other camera as sure. well. And it, it, as soon as we started tilting, it showed up again here. You don't don't see it in these darks as much, but in the browns, it really shows up. Mm. But this is something that we're definitely just seeing on the wall. Like I'm not seeing it in the you know off the wall, above the wall, or below it. 
Yeah. Since we're not seeing it in the physical, right. like that that's the big key. Is if it's right. if it's not in the physical environment, yeah. then it's it's something with the camera and the wall. Well, let's see how the raptor's doing. Oh, I see that there too immediately. Mm, that one's a lot some. bigger. Yeah. What I'm really surprised to see is a couple of the more well-known cameras, the the Aries and the Red Raptor, um, which seem to exhibit some screen tearing right out of the box. Uh, that happened um, pretty quickly. I mean, we could see with just basic movement, screen tearing occurring in some limited areas. Just to find that banding in there was um, was sort of, yeah, it was surprising. I know that regardless of the scale of the production, it one of the most important things using volumes is test. Test, test, come in, do as much testing as you can, but it certainly is interesting to see this global shutter seem to handle this uh, fairly flawlessly, at least from the, the tearing aspect. Yeah. So I know from shooting with global shutters in the past that they eliminate a lot of issues when it comes to shooting on screens. Um, and there have been projects in the past where I specifically chose a global shutter because I knew that it eliminated so many of the, of the little gremlins, as I often call them. Um, it eliminates flicker quite often when you're shooting into an LED wall. Um, and the Komodo today certainly held up to that uh, standard. Um, and it was the only global shutter camera that we actually tested. There aren't a lot of global shutter cameras available on the market. As volumes become more popular to shoot on, they become more prevalent, more commonplace. I, I can certainly see the manufacturers starting to incorporate this this idea into their engineering a bit. I was surprised to see that the Venice and the Komodo were our two best performing cameras. We put them through bright scenes and we had a dark scene that we used them on and we didn't have any screen tearing. So right out of the box, the Komodo is good to go. You're going to have great results with it. And the Venice is also one of the best options out there. I want to say a big thank you to all the camera owners out there who have given us their cameras for the day to allow this testing to be possible. If you have any interest in renting any of these cameras, see their information in the description below. Well, that was really fun, guys. I mean, we had some crazy results, some unexpected issues, problems. Uh, we certainly answered a lot of questions, but probably also brought up some more that would take some more testing for us to figure out. I think one of the biggest takeaways is also just pre-production, testing, testing, testing. Make sure that you are figuring this stuff out before you get to production day because you don't want to waste time and money while you have a full crew here and talent and client, most importantly. Once again, I want to thank Tom and Mick for being here today with us. We have tons more content coming for you this year on YouTube, including two more series. Stay tuned for those. If you want to learn something more specific about virtual production and in-camera VFX, please leave us comments. We would love to touch on those subjects. And if you have any interest in building your own volume, we would love to help consult and help you figure that out. See the description below for form volumes. That's it for today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>